What is up, guys? Welcome to my channel. Woo -woo. All right, today we are going to be talking about Broadway shows that should have tried a bit harder. I'm just kidding. They tried the best they could, they tried. But, you know, how to fail in show business without really trying by Abby Broadman. That's me. All right, let's get started. Let's get started. All right, so first off, for a little, little business, show business woo -woo -woo -woo, is a terrible business. Sorry. Um, first of all, only about a quarter of Broadway shows are actually profitable, which raises the question, why is Broadway a business at all? And how do people even make money? Probably only 25% that actually do make money. Um, and, you know, I mean, it makes sense. There's a lot of costs in Broadway shows. There's the actors, there's the creative team, which includes uh, the librettist, the composer, the producer, director, choreographer, stage manager, like everyone, set designer, costume, you, you know. Okay, and then we got the the actual cast, then we've got the tech design people, just the tech people in general, um, and that's just the people involved with the show. We're not even talking about secondary people, like people who manage the payroll, people who uh, do marketing, people who, um, you know, what's the other stuff, <laughs> management, all that stuff. We're not even talking about those, like it's just a lot of overhead costs. Oh, we didn't even talk about renting theater, theater, theater renting. That's a lot. Um, a lot of overhead costs and really their main source of revenue is ticket sales. Ticket sales and then um, if they get to record an album, the album sales. Uh, yeah, so if they're not able to get good enough ticket sales or good enough album sales, then they are, they're, they're not doing too great. Okay, so why aren't more of them flops? And what makes these Broadway runs such failures? Like they really, they really flopped. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie, my friends. So a little background. Uh, first of all, we're actually gonna start with this bullet point, which is Broadway shows usually have an initial budget of six to $12 million, which in my humble opinion, that is a lot, but like I was saying before, they do have to do a lot of stuff. They do have to pay a lot of stuff, um, a lot of people. So honestly, makes sense. And we're talking about modern Broadway, like, uh, you know, 2021, not necessarily like 1980 or 1960 or heaven forbid 1920, right? Because inflation and then overall uh, expectations of what Broadway shows should present technically. So um, yeah. Second, uh, Broadway managers aren't always great at managing money. It wasn't until 2011 that Broadway accounting actually started using spreadsheets. Like, have you heard of Excel? Amazing. I'm literally being serious when I'm saying that how they used to do payroll and stuff was that the accountants for the show used to like call each other and over the phone they would tell people like what they were owed like they had they had the little list and they're like actor a you get I'm just making up a number $2,500 and then, and then the other person would record it and it'd be over the phone. As a reminder, email was invented at this time as well as the internet. So it's just honest. I mean, maybe that's why Broadway shows tanked so badly was because they had this really bad system. I'm not gonna lie. Anyways, so fun little fact for you. Spreadsheets should, sa should save everyone. All right. So we've got the three types of flops. We've got musicals that shouldn't have ever been musicals. Like, please, dear God, don't be musicals. Uh, we've got wrong audience, wrong show. We'll talk about that. And then tech nightmares. So let's get started. 
Musicals should not have ever been musicals. We've got Breakfast at Tiffany's, Annie 2, Miss Hannigan's Revenge, and Kelly. Okay, so those are our three we're gonna talk about for this segment. First, we're gonna talk about the Disney live action problem. So I'm sure all of you have seen Disney live action shows that have come out. Even in the future, people are watching this beyond what's the month of May 2021. And they're like, whoa, you didn't mention this movie. It's, it's part of the same problem, my friends, it, where people, especially Disney, so we're talking about this problem in particular, where they look at an animated film and they're like, this was successful. Let's make this into a live action film. And uh, it will also probably su be successful. And uh, that's the thing just because something is successful doesn't mean you should turn it into a movie or musical. And why is that? First of all, if you're not going to bring anything new to the story, then why do it? You know, like, it, just taking it in between mediums, that's not a good enough answer. And second, crossing between mediums is very hard to do well. It doesn't work well unless you know how to do it well. Let's talk about books to movies because that is a genre crossing that gets talked about a lot. Like famous books, they get made into movies and then everyone's like, that sucked. And it's because they don't really understand the strengths and weaknesses of the mediums. Like let's talk about books to movies. The strength of a book is that it can be however long you want it to be. Um, you know, it can be, 600 pages, 1200 pages, it's fine. People will read it as long as it's a good story. However, uh, you can't make a five hour movie and expect people to sit it through, even if it has all the stuff that the book does. So strengths and weaknesses. Let's talk about strengths and weaknesses of a movie and musical. Like you've got to know this stuff because if you take a movie that was successful and turn it into a musical and don't critically think about the strengths and differences, strengths and weaknesses, then you, you're gonna flop. You gotta think about this stuff. <sighs> so why is a Disney live action problem even happening? Well, it's because investors like certainty, especially if the lowest they can invest is $250,000. If you thought, hey, I'd love to help my favorite musical get off, off its feet and get up. Um, you, unless you have $250,000 in spare cash, it's probably not realistic. It's a lot of money, at least to me. This feels like a lot of money. <laughs> so they wanna make sure that it works out. Um, so if you're thinking, oh, okay, well, the two musicals I have in front of me are Mulan the musical or an unknown musical, you're probably gonna say, oh, well, Mulan, uh, the film did really well, the first one, the animated one, the film did really well, it'll probably do well as a musical. And then you're gonna go with that one. Like, it kind of makes sense, honestly. And sometimes it does work. Like, let's look at this, Mean Girls, Heathers, Legally Blonde, but it's because they actually do a good job at making a good musical instead of like, instead of, I don't know, just transporting it, like they actually, they make good songs, catchy songs that I'm gonna sing when I'm just in my own house. Like, like, you know, I can't think of any of them right now, but they gave your opinion. That one, absolute bop. Um, yeah. And they actually made a good musical. They improved on the story. They recognized, okay, what are the strengths of a musical? And they played to that instead of just being like, let's just make this uh, into a musical. Bada bing, bada boom. All right, so we've covered that. So let's go on to Breakfast at Tiffany's. A lot of you guys might recognize this movie, uh, probably have seen it as well. It's very famous. It stars Audrey Hepburn. Um, and this musical was made in 1966, and it starred Mary Tyler Moore and Richard Chamberlain, 
I don't expect you to know those people. I don't, so just wanted to say that, but breakfast at Tiffany's. Let's get started. So the plot, it's a romantic comedy starring Holly. She falls in love with a struggling writer, Paul. It, this takes place in Manhattan. She's got multiple lovers. We've got Doc, Jose, and Paul. Doc was her previous marriage. That, by the way, she married when she was 14. I'm pretty sure she's like 19 in this, but I know for a fact she married Doc at 14, which is very interesting, but they're divorced now. So we've got Doc, we've got Jose, which is the guy she wants to marry for his money because she wants money. Uh, and Paul, which is the one she eventually ends up with. Okay, so she's trying to save up money for her brother in the army, but that, can, that kind of plot goes away when she learns that he died in a Jeep accident, which is really sad. Rip, rip brother. Uh, they get caught up with the mob because that's the side plot because she kind of knows some people in the mob. So they get caught up and Holly goes to jail for a night when Jose sends her a letter that he's like, girl, we can't get married because you got something on your permanent record. I can't marry someone who's been in jail. And she's like, I want to marry you anyways, because I want that money. But then Paul's like, no, girl, marry me. I, I'm your one true love. I'll give you a life that you'll love. And then later she's like, hmm, that is a good point, especially because Jose's probably not going to marry me. So then she chases him. They meet up in an alleyway. They kiss. It's very romantic. I'm pretty sure there's rain. Like, hmm, chef's kiss. Okay. Why didn't it work? Well, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of what made the original great. It, honestly, it works great as a movie, but it, it just doesn't work great as a musical. Like Stephen Sondheim in his book, Finishing the Hat, where he talks about how to write lyrics and basically how to write for musicals. He says some characters just don't sing, some plots don't sing, and that's okay. Like, it's okay, you don't have to be musical. I'm sorry, but that's just not what you're meant to be. The Telegraph tell described it as a play with songs, which technically that is what musicals are, but the fact that they described it that way kind of reiterates what it was. I mean, it, it really wasn't, songs were kind of add-ins and they, it just didn't work. I'm sorry. I, I probably, I would never want to see a musical rendition of how to make, or what is it, how to uh, fall in love with a guy in 10 dates. I forgot. I forgot what it's called, but you know, or When Harry Met Sally or Sleepless in Seattle, like all that stuff. It, they worked great as movies, but I don't love them as musicals. I should probably go faster on this. I'm sorry. All right, so how do, how do we fix it? Well, we get Stephen Sondheim to write it in the style of company, just constant singing. You know, play with songs? Well, now it's just a song, beat that. Or just make it a play, not a musical. That could probably work really well. It probably would. All right, let's go on to Kelly, 1965. So as you can see, this is the poster. There's a guy falling off his hat and a rose. I don't know what the rose is for. Let's just forget about the rose. It's just there for aesthetic. All right, so here's the thing. Here's the plot. This is a true story, by the way. Um, the When the writers went to the producer with this idea, the producer was like, you guys, I have been trying to make, I love this story. I want this to be a musical. I've been thinking about this for years and years and years, which I think is kind of funny because I don't really think it's that good of a story in my opinion, but let's get, let's get on with the story. So we've got Kelly, who is a daredevil bus boy. So basically, if you've ever seen the movie Hot Rod, this is Hot Rod, except it's not, but He's hot rod. Okay, so Kelly, a daredevil bus boy, he's determined to jump off the Brooklyn Bridge. No one knows why, but he just wants to. 
Um, and he's tried and failed three times at jumping off this bridge because he's chickened out, which, you know, I don't blame him too bad. Like jumping off the bridge, that is pretty scary and kind of stupid. So I applaud him for that. But the problem is, is that a bunch of gamblers bet on him and they were like, hey, I'll give you $50 if he, <laughs> terrible accent, I'll, I'll give you $50 if he jumps off the bridge, yada bing bada boom. And then he doesn't. So then they're like, we're out $50. We got to go catch him and make him jump off. So anyways, there's like a bunch of that going around. They're like running around. And then something I don't mention here is that they eventually, they're like fed up with trying to get Kelly to jump off. So they get a mannequin that's like him. And they, they're like, we're just going to throw this off and <laughs> pretend it's Kelly. I don't know who that was going to fool, but that was their train of thought. And then Kelly was like, no, my pride. And he does jump off the bridge right then. And he survives. So good job for Kelly. All right. So why didn't it work? Well, first of all, I just, this, this show, oh my God. Uh, the budget was set at $350,000, but then cost went up to $650,000, which if you're doing math at home, $300,000 more than the initial budget. I don't know why it was that much because it doesn't seem like a show that really needs that much pyrotechnics, but it had a lot of money issues. Um, it closed after its opening night performance, which as I was talking about, the main profit that you get on a Broadway show are the ticket sales and the album sales um and it didn't get ticket sales so baby it just didn't work accounting for a total financial loss yikes honestly some plots don't sing this plot could have sang if they tried to make it like a comedy like I was like hot rod like if they made it a comedy if they made it like a Cohan-esque musical I think it would have worked at least a little better. But the creators, oh boy, wanted to make it an artistic statement about modern life, not as a Broadway entertainment. I don't know how you look at that storyline and you think this is a museum piece because it definitely didn't sound that way to me. So it was said to be an extremely droll show with no redeeming songs. Mm. Poor Kelly. Uh, how to fix, make it more of a character piece. I want to know, why does Kelly want to jump off the bridge? Is it because his father wants to jump off the bridge? Is it because his father has cancer and he wants to jump off and then beat his father up? That's a reference to Hot Rod. Uh, that should be his backstory. Flesh them out instead of using them as symbols of society. This should not have been a museum piece. And fully lean into a genre, not the museum piece. Um, it, it just should have been a comedy. I say thriller or comedy, but I, come on. We all know this is a comedy. This is a comedy. All right, let's go on. Annie 2, Miss Harrigan's Revenge, 1989. So he, Annie 2, uh, this was straight, like this was made just for greed. That's the whole reason this was made because Annie 2 came out and it, was a sleeper hit. No one thought it was gonna be as good or get as much traction as it did, but people loved that show. And so then producers were like, I mean, I want money. So they were like, let's make a sequel. Um, which if, if you're gonna make a musical based off greed, I think that is a poor motivator just because musicals, like I was saying before, they don't make that good of a profit. So um, yeah, and sequels, as we all know, usually aren't as good as the first one. Okay, so let's talk about it. Here's the plot. All right, Miss Hannigan is in prison, but not for long. She escapes during a fire looking for revenge. Daddy Warbucks is told that it's illegal for an unmarried man to adopt an 11-year-old girl, so he puts out an ad for anyone willing to marry a bald man with $900 million. Sorry, I always 
have a hard time saying this part. $900 million as a reward, which I think is kind of funny because he's like, will anyone love a bald billionaire? Ah, oh. and everyone's like, bro, yeah, I would for 900, but I'm not even, I wouldn't even consider myself a gold digger. And even I'm like, that's a good deal, honestly. And I get a little kid and a dog as a perk, like prime gig. Anyways, <clears throat> Miss Hannigan reads this notice and light bulb moment disguise or decides to disguise herself and enter the contest. She also finds a girl that looks exactly like Annie and plans to switch them out <laughs> once she wins the contest. So like parent trapped thing. And she actually does this. She kidnaps Annie and then switches her out for, for fake Annie. And I think for a tiny bit, it actually does work. <laughs> Daddy Warbucks is like, my beloved daughter. And Miss Hannigan's like, <laughs> which I, you know, maybe there is a good reason that that law is in place if he can't even recognize his daughter. Um, but Hannigan is eventually found out and they get happily ever after. Bada bing, bada boom. All right, so why didn't it work? Well, it got $7 million for the budget, but it didn't really earn it back. Didn't get any positive reviews, like zero, zero positive reviews. No one liked this show. So why not? Well, first of all, sequels don't do well, which is a shame because, because I, I think this is, I think, you know, Broadway sequels could work out. I would like to see more sequels, but here's the thing about sequels. Let's get into the finance of the sequels, okay? So when a studio does a sequel, it's usually just for money, right? Yeah. Um, and we all know sequels don't really do as well uh, the, as, as the first one. So why make sequels at all? Well, it's because you have a big enough studio that you're able to cushion your losses with the sequel. Plus, um, with movies, you can you can showcase it lots of different places. Uh, you know, if people can watch it as many times as possible. Broadway musicals usually only go once. Uh, tickets are expensive. It's in like one or two cities across the country. It's just they're wildly different markets. Market. So it makes sense that movies have so many sequels, but Broadway really doesn't, which is again, too bad. I'm sorry about my glasses, by the way. I wish I could take them off, but then I can't see my, my notes. So gonna have to deal with my no blue light glasses. Um, there was so much interest, like it literally got booked out months uh, before it opened, which is key word. The before is doing a lot of heavy lifting in that sentence before it opened, because after it opened, no one wanted to see it. Uh, it tried to appeal to adults, which was a mistake. I don't know who watched Annie and was like, hmm, I liked this. But you know what would make it better is if it were a gritty thriller. That just doesn't happen. Uh, <laughs> so it didn't have enough Annie. Like, let's, let's look at Let's look at this, okay? So in my plot sum summary that I wrote, uh, can you find where I say Annie? Is it up here? No. Is it down here? Oh, yes, right here. I say it once. I know this is a plot summary I wrote, but if you look at other plot summaries, they really don't talk about Annie at all. Annie is not a strong character in this plot. Um, and it's called Annie too. <laughs> so that was the mistake. It didn't, Annie had no autonomy this whole show. She was just a pawn. And the first Annie, yeah, Annie didn't get a lot of decisions, but it was through her eyes. Like through her eyes, we got to see the wonders of having a family, the wonders of discovering all this new stuff and leaping lizards. Like, all that stuff, you, you saw it through her eyes and that was the magic of it. 
uh, they even had a showing where they had 700 kids in an audience and it was a mistake because none of the kids liked it at all. And so the kids weren't having fun, the parents weren't having fun, and that was the problem. Like they just forgot their target audience, which is bad. Um, they only had one song that was even close to being catchy and they, ch they marketed that hard. Like on nearly all their posters, it's called When You Smile. They had When You Smile like on every poster because they knew that was the only catchy one. <laughs> so, um, the, and there were a lot of really bad reviews that just ripped them to shreds. The Washington Post said, Annie was a musical to take to your heart, but you'll want to take a paddle to Annie too, which is fair. Uh, how do we fix it? You can't make a hit musical based on greed, unfortunately. And you need to remember your target audience, kids. So give us more Annie and less grown up dialogue. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we want more Annie. If you say Annie too, I want too much Annie, okay? All right. Uh, and also just put in an audience, that showing just should, should have been me. Put in an audience of me's, cause I would pay this, I would pay to see this if only just to laugh at it. Cause I think it's kooky. I think if they, again, maybe I'm just too much of a fan of Cohan, but I think if they had done like a Cohan-esque stuff or like Marx Brothers type thing, I think it would have been fun. I don't know. Maybe just don't call it Annie too. Maybe just call it Miss Hannigan's Revenge. I don't know. Okay. All right. Second segment. I think we spent like 10 minutes on the first one. So sorry about that. We're going to spend just as long here. Um, wrong audience, wrong show. We've got American Psycho, Carrie, and Rocky Horror Show. So let's get started. As soon as I click the next slide. All right, American Psycho, a new musical thriller. So this is based, all of these are based off of other shows. Um, so this is another example of like medium crossing, uh, but for a different reason, okay? Uh, so here we go, American Psycho. If you've seen the movie, then you'll know the plot. It's basically the same plot. They didn't change much of it. Uh, and here we go. Patrick Bateman, a Wall Street executive, is also a serial killer. I mean, he's not a serial, serial killer in the way that, like, you know, he has to kill everyone with the name A or something, a name that starts with A. He's just, like, anyone that annoys him, he's just, like, dead. That's kind of like how he is. Um, he kills erratically and also tries desperately to fit into the Wall Street crowd. He really cares about it. He's what 2000 slang would call a metrosexual and that he just really, really cares about his parents. There's this one scene where he and his fellow Wall Street executives are all lining up to, and, and they're all like exchanging their, their business cards and it's very tense, super tense. Um, he really cares about this stuff. He kills more and more and hides them in an apartment he owns anonymously. He really craves punishment and he even leaves a voicemail to his lawyer confessing, but no one believes him. Like the next day his lawyer's like, oh, you're so funny. Oh my God, I love you, Patrick. And he, and Patrick ends up marrying his shallow fiance and he's really sad that he won't be punished he's really sad about it it's like a sad ending <laughs> and so that's it that's the show oh yeah we're gonna talk about them later all right Carrie here we go Carrie uh if, and it was written in 1988 this was based off of the Stephen King novel um by the same name uh, and here is, you know, a picture of Carrie getting doused in pig's blood and then the poster, yada, yada, yada. So the plot, Carrie, who is a teenage girl with a telekinetic powers and an overbearing religious mom, like really bad, is also mercilessly bullied at high school. One guy, Tommy, takes pity on her and asks her out to the prom. 
She goes with him and has a great time. She's even crowned prom king, queen, <laughs> with Tommy. Tommy's crowned prom king, so they're together. Uh, but it was a cruel joke. Pig's blood is emptied onto her, like a whole bucket of pig's blood, and she's humiliated. Furious, she kills nearly everyone at the prom except for this girl named Sue. Uh, and then she goes home, then her mom, who's, remember, she's overly religious, her mom's like, she's a monster. So her mom stabs her because she's hoping to save Carrie's soul. And Carrie kills her mom in return. So both of them die. Basically, everyone dies, and that's the end. More on Carrie. Okay, so it was originally a book by Stephen King. Um, and the musical creators, especially the composer, they went and saw a production of Albenberg's Lulu. I think they were in Paris and they walked away and they were like, this is stunning. For anyone who doesn't know who Albenberg is, um, he is a kind of classical composer uh, in the early 1900s. And he wrote a lot of what classical musicians call atonal music, which means that it doesn't really have music in uh, like keys like C major or D major. Uh, it, it has a lot of notes that don't really relate to each other in the way that we would think they would relate. That's a really poor explanation of Alban Berg, but basically when you listen to his music, you get confused and maybe a little angry. That's, that's kind of the consensus of what atonal music is. So you were inspired by Alban Berg's Lulu and the guy walked out and he was like, if Alban Berg was writing today, he would write Carrie. So then they were like, let's write Carrie. Um, but the director changed the vision into something else entirely. We're gonna talk a little bit about this later with another musical, but basically, uh, the director was like, let's make this into a great tragedy. I don't know why. <laughs> so instead of like uh, putting their all their actors into, I don't know, high school clothes, like teen, what teenagers would wear into regular American clothes, he had everyone in tunics and yoga, or <laughs> in togas and had like a giant white staircase as the set design like it was it was kind of funky uh yeah and the producers were all like or the creators were all like oh my god what is happening um and the funniest thing about this is that he uh what who was it that said it um the producer went to this guy, to the director, and they're like, okay, our vision, make it like Greece. And the director was like, okay. And he had everyone in togas, like what I was saying. And then, so this is at the beginning of the run. And then the producers came back and were like, wait, what? No, we were, we said Greece the musical, like, like Sandy and, and, you know, 50s musical. And the guy was like, oh, I thought you meant Greece, like togas. <laughs> so always clarify. Um, it closed after 16 previews and five performances and lost all 8 million of its budget. It did really bad, you guys. Um, it was really bad. There's more on it. Like, for instance, I think the first uh, the first preview, uh, everyone booed right after. And but then the lights came up and then some people started clapping. And that's kind of the audience reaction to it is that some people really hated it and some people really liked it. So kind of a weird reaction we got from it. Um, how to fix. I actually really like the show. The songs are great. Check out uh, Eve Was Weak. And uh, another song to check out is Evening Prayers. Uh, they're both really good. However, it's all, its inspiration was Alban Berg and it shows it didn't quite fit a Broadway musical, especially with the direction that the director took it in. Um, it has had a decent revival in the past few years, mainly because they took it off to off Broadway. So that's how they fixed it. They did fix it. Um, and they involved the original creators. 
So in this revival that's been going on, you know, they put people in actual high school clothes um, and really focused on what made this such a good hit in the first place. So the reason that this is in um, wrong audience, wrong show is because with both American Psycho and Carrie, they just had the wrong audience. Like Broadway audiences are not, you know, totally loving the whole horror vibe, unless it's a horror comedy like Sweeney Todd and uh, Beetlejuice, I don't know. Uh, so Carrie didn't quite fit the scene and then American Psycho just didn't have great, a great score. It was kind of hollow and it, it did have a terrible marketing. So anyways, that's the horror trend. Let's go on, oh yeah, Broadway audience. So a key part of marketing is understanding your audience. So Taurus, that's part of the Broadway audience, upper middle class and higher patrons and theater buffs. Okay, and especially with theater buffs, um, a, a big way that you attract your, your audience in Broadway is you have a cast recording and you send it out and then people listen to the cast recording and they love it. They love these songs. They listen to it all the time. And that's why they travel to go see the show is because they're like, this is a great show. I love it. I love the songs. And then even if the show is bad, at least they love the songs. You know, so if you if you don't like a song, then you're not gonna like the show. That's just an unfortunate thing. Both the horror move musicals flourished at the music theater, or excuse me, at the uh, movie theater because you had a wider audience. Uh, even off Broadway would have worked better, like it did with Carrie eventually. But the prestige shine of Broadway doesn't handle gritty horror plots well. So they've since become cult classics in their own right, except I don't know about American Psycho. I'm pretty sure a lot of people are ready to just let that one go. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Rocky Horror Show, 1973. This actually came before Rocky Horror Picture Show, which is the movie version of it. Um, okay, so let's talk about the plot. So the plot, a newlywed couple, Janet and Brad has a flat tire and finds a castle nearby to stay in for the night. Dr. Frankenfurter welcomes them to the annual Transylvanian convention that's going on. He tells the couple that he's discovered the secret to life. He's brought his creation, Rocky, to life. So a lot of wacky things ensue after this. A messenger dies. Frank, Dr. Frank, uh, seduces the couple. Janet's really mad about that so then she goes off runs off and makes an emotional connection with Rocky and Janet sleeps with Rocky. Frank turns everyone into nude statues for some reason and then unfreezes them and makes them all perform in a live cabaret show. Then Frank and his friends, he's got two friends, uh, reveal themselves to be aliens from the planet transsexual and I think it's in the galaxy Transylvania. Um, his friends kill Frank and another person just just for fun and they announce they're going to go home because they they're sick of Frank holding them on earth they don't want to be on earth any longer a uh, Rocky angrily picks up Frank and jumps off a tower and Rocky dies then the friends leave for the stars with the castle in tow apparently the castle is a starship so so they take the castle and they head for the stars and the couple just crawls around in the dirt after. And that's the end. So if you ever want to know what Rocky Horror Picture Show is about, it's the same plot. Um, the musical came first and then the movie. I think it was honestly just a matter of wrong audience. I don't think it really worked as um, a musical, especially, I don't know. Broadway can host some weird stuff, but it just didn't work for the Broadway audience, I don't think, especially not then. Like now I think people go to it and they like it, but it's because they know what it is. You know, like it, it became a cult phenomenon um, because down here in How to Fix, they did, they made the movie and the community drag shows that popped up around it let it just become a cult classic. Like now you go to Rocky Horror Picture Show and it's a phenomenon. 
you go and you see your friends act out the plot and say the lines and dress up and it's super fun you can boo them you can throw tomatoes at them you can cheer like it's just very fun but uh and it's very intimate I think but uh Broadway mainstream Broadway too wacky I'm sorry but the the movie did really well and I think I also think the movie only did well because it tried out the musical part and was like, okay, well, let's take what did work, what didn't work, whatever, and turn into the movie. Okay, so tech nightmares. This is my favorite part. And good job for staying with me all this way. You guys are the troopers. All right, so we've got King Kong and Spider-Man turn off the dark. So King Kong, this was in, 2013 and yeah it was really that big they put a lot of effort into making this monkey all right and there's there's the human so for scale and and here's the plot an actress Anne goes to shoot a film on Skull Island King Kong grabs Anne and runs off with her to his cave which I think is very similar to Beauty and the Beast, like this whole plot just reeks of Beauty and the Beast vibes. Um, but then they catch up, uh, Anne's friends and like co-workers catch up to him and they gas him and take him to New York to show him off. And Anne feels bad because she's like, I actually kind of liked you. I'm sorry, I like you. Uh, and they had a moment in the cave. So then she goes and visit it, visits him. And she's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you're not doing too hot. I'm sorry, I played a role in this. And King Kong's like, I'm not talking to you. But, and then eventually gets real mad and he like rips off his shackles and then climbs the Empire State Building and holds Anne. And Anne's like, yeah, you go, man. And then army planes come and shoot at him. But he's like, mm, no not today but it was today because there were too many so then it was too much for him he falls off the building to his death and Anne is heartbroken and later helps his legacy she tells everyone how he wasn't a monster and that's the end that's King Kong for you sorry there's no Godzilla in there big monkey um <laughs> the budget was 35 million dollars or no, yes, $35 million. I always get confused with this format of, of writing it out. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, which is a lot, as you might recall, uh, the general budget is six to 12 million. So I percent, if you're gonna be a spectacle, spectacle musical, commit to it. They had the giant ass robot, which was, it was, commandeered by 15 people like it was huge but I just really think they could have done a little bit better or like done more with the spectacle but it probably would have cost a lot more than that so I don't know I just don't think they could have really done with it and then the plot was boring according to reviewers which I kind of agree I agree uh, it had some outdated views on feminism. The leading lady was supposed to be independent. Like she was supposed to be like real sassy and she was, but then she she just was a damsel in distress the whole time. She didn't have a whole lot of autonomy. Um, so yeah, if they wanted to make a musical, they should have done King Kong versus Godzilla. I said what I said. Um, yeah, think of a new story where you don't have make King Kong the damsel in distress. That's what I'm saying. Or just put a guy in a mon monkey suit. Like, I don't know. Like, I think that would have been fun. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> or just don't make the musical. Who wanted this to be a musical? I don't know. I don't know, man. It just, why? Why? So anyways, poor King Kong. May he rest in peace. Okay. Spider-Man, turn off the dark. This was... Wait, was it really done in 2001? Okay, I think so. I get confused sometimes, conflicting stories, conflicting. Um, but 2001, this is, this is hilarious and I'm gonna take you through it. So the plot, there are multiple iterations of this, um, but I'm gonna take you through the original one. So it's a frame story, which means it's a story happening within a story. So the so the, the 
the outside story, the frame, is the Geek Chorus, which I think is a hilarious name. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, the Geek Chorus, and they're like, they, they've got a class assignment to make the most outrageous story possible. And they're like, I'm gonna write about Spider-Man. So they do. In this story, Peter Parker isn't just a random boy. He was chosen by the Greek goddess Arachne, which, by the way, I don't think is an actual Greek goddess, but whatever, to be a hero. Um, even though he does, he does get bitten by a spider at Norman observatories or laboratories or whatever. Uh, so that part is still the same, but it was like all engineered by Arachne. And then Uncle Ben dies in the same way that he normally does. Uh, and she and he's all grieving. And then Arachne comes to him in a vision and is like, wear a suit made of red and blue. Here it is, I made it for you. And then Peter fights the Green Goblin. And the Green Goblin dies at the act one. And then the Geek Chorus, so, so act one ends. And then the Geek Chorus comes up back at the start of act two and is like, yeah, that's it, yeah. And then the teacher is like, wait, but the villain should be invincible. I don't know why, like lots of superhero villains are not invincible, but that's the position that this teacher decides to take. So then the geek course is like, well, all right then, I'm gonna introduce the Sinister Six, which is a thing in Spider-Man comics. It's the group called the Sinister Six. It's like the Suicide Squad or whatever. It's just a, it's just a group of villains that team up and want to take the superhero down. Could it also be the name of their book club? Perhaps. I would love to see them become a book club. I'm getting off topic. So Sinister Six. Peter gets tired of being Spider-Man and abandons it like Super Spider-Man 2. Uh, Arachne gets mad at the storytelling. So now she's in. It's kind of confusing because she was in the like made up story. But now she's like in the frame story. She gets mad at the storytelling. She's like, Geek Chorus, you're telling it wrong. And she takes over the script because she wants to be with Peter romantically for some reason. She's like, whoa, there's another spider person that I made and I want to be with him. So she takes over the storytelling and then he defeats the Sinister Six, um, which defeats the, the teacher's whole idea of like, they need to be invincible. Um, but then Arachne has kidnapped Mary Jane and she's like, Peter, I'm going to kill MJ unless you decide to be with me, which is really messed up. But then Arachne realizes that she is, she does have some humanity. Uh, so then she's like, okay, you can have MJ. So then Peter has MJ and they fall in love and she finds out that he's Spider-Man and then he continues being Spider-Man. And that's the plot. <laughs> if you're wondering, if you're thinking to yourself, how did this get to be a plot? I'm with you. Wow, so this is another story, another musical where uh, for some reason, Greek, Greek myths play a lot of factor, a lot of, they carry a lot of weight in this story. Carrie had Greek people for some reason. Spider-Man had Greek people for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> okay, so I'm just, I'm just laughing. I laugh every time I think of this. I just think it's hilarious. So it's my favorite flop of all time. It had a budget of $100 million. I'm pretty sure it even surpassed it. Like I think originally it did have a, a budget of like 40 million and then it went to 50 and they're like, that's it. That's it. I mean, we're gonna get it. And then it just quickly ballooned. Why didn't it work? So many injuries. Um, it literally so many injuries uh and you know someone was talking to me about they're like well Cirque du Soleil has like an injury every night like whatever which by the way if you're having an injury every night oof but um so they're like why is this a big deal so I looked into it and basically it's just that it's, this show isn't made out to have so many injuries I mean if you have your main people get injured um 
you know, they had to memorize all these lines and stuff. I just feel like it's a lot more of a risk getting your actors injured than like maybe someone who is a little bit more replaceable like your trapeze artists. Obviously trapeze artists are super talented and they are like, there's not a lot of them, but it, I think it is easier to replace them just because they don't have like a face that goes with it. Anyways, but there's also like, they just had really bad tech stuff. Like, oof, there was this one injury that happened. So the, the actors did have to have stunt actors as well, or stunt doubles. And Spider-Man's stunt double, there's this one part where he has to like go up and then jump off this thing. And, you know, it would be fine because it, you know, he's got a little wire and stuff. But then the guy, there's this one night that he went off and he jumped off and he realized as he jumped off, he's like, it's not connected. So he fell like 30 feet into the pit and shattered his back. Like it was bad. There's a lot of stuff. He nearly died. Eventually, I think he made like a pretty decent recovery, but he nearly died, you guys. That's not good. No, and it's not good for your press. I mean, did someone say Macbeth in the in the theater? Because a lot of stuff. Uh, their tech just backfired all the time. I mean, I talked about it a little bit with the stun double, but it just backfired like all the time. So, um, and it's just, part of it was because the theater wasn't built for this tech. They they rented out a theater that was made in like the 30s. Like it was an old theater. And so then they had to renovate it to make it suitable for the kind of tech they were doing. Like so that was a whole thing. And they had to pay a lot of money for that. It was just, it was a lot, you guys. Um, too convoluted of a story and not catching up songs. No one was humming any of the songs from this musical. So too much money at the start that they could never hope to recoup it. Yeah, they, like I was saying, I think their initial budget was 30 million, which is a lot. And so then every turn that they made, they were like, well, we can't stop now. We've already sunk so much money into this. So I just think that's what was it. If it wasn't, if it didn't cost too much, then it would have been okay. Um, all right, and then the last thing why it didn't work, they forgot why people actually like Spider-Man. They don't, I mean, there's there's loads of heroes out there that are destined to become heroes or whatever. And that's fine, that works for their storyline, people like them, whatever. But the whole reason people like Spider-Man is because he's a nobody, he's like you and me. He just randomly got bit by a spider, which is something we all do, at least, I mean, I hope I don't, but I'm pretty sure I have been bitten by a spider at some point. And he turns to a superhero and he's just like, you know, he makes mistakes like the rest of us. He's just a nobody. He's this guy from Brooklyn, like whatever. Or is it Queens? I kind of forgot. Um, anyways, uh, he's just this guy. He's not a, he's not a hero. So, I mean, he is a hero, but like, he's not destined to be here. So how to fix it um make it a campy show I just love campy shows I think they're so funny there is there's two that come to mind which coincidentally both have that in their names uh there's Holy Musical Batman which is on um YouTube and that is really good for campy uh superhero films or Bat Boy the Musical which I, I just think is hilarious uh, for how to make a campy superhero musical so that you don't have to spend millions on tech. Like just put some guy in a Spider-Man costume and just go to town, just have a fun time. Like if you're having fun, the audience will have fun. You know, you don't have to go all Mary Poppins on us and make everyone fly. Um, don't make it a Greek myth. Like literally why, why? why do it? I think the name Geek Chorus is funny, but the whole Arachne thing, I don't know. I just didn't like it, and a lot of people didn't. She actually did eventually get cut from the script um, in, like, the fifth iteration or whatever. Action scenes don't really translate well to musicals, so that's just a thing. They, a lot of action scenes are just fighting, 
in musicals. So I don't know, make it like a Newsies musical. Wait, that would actually work. <laughs> <laughs> like a super uh, or a spider-man newsies show like yeah j jonas jameson is the main guy newsies and i don't know <laughs> make it into a musical <laughs> um all right i got off topic uh and just watch the sam Raimi movies. Is that how you say Raimi? Watch the Sam Raimi movies because there are enough of them in the musical. There's they're dramatic enough. Like Spider-Man 3, that's a musical. Just watch it. So what did what did we learn from this class? Uh don't try to make everything into a musical. Please. Uh think about your audience. Remember who you're who you're writing for and who you're acting for. Uh, don't try to make your musical a Greek myth. You don't, if, it, with no context, you'd be like, Abby, why is this a rule? Wouldn't people know not to make things a Greek myth? I'm like, someone did it, so I have to put it down. Uh, don't try to make your musical a Greek myth. That only works with actual Greek myths. Like, Hades Town, they did a great job. That was a Greek myth. They made it into a great musical. Don't, don't just, don't try to, don't do it, though, if it's not an actual Greek myth. Um, if your actors are constantly getting injured, that might be a sign. And also, if you are stopping your tech during shows, you can actually look it up. There are compilations of the, all the times that Spider-Man has stopped during actual performances, not just during preview performances or whatever, but like actual performances. And then honestly, just go listen to all of them because they're really iconic. Um, yeah, especially, okay, so what are my favorite musicals? I think Carrie actually does have a great soundtrack. Um, <laughs> that might be it <laughs> as far as actually having good songs. Um, I would go listen to, to the Miss Hannigan's Revenge. I don't actually think they, they did a cast album. Um, but if they did, I would go listen to it. Um, I think I am going to go listen to Spider-Man musical just to like hear what they went with. Um, probably going to go listen to King Kong. Uh, but yeah, just go listen to all of them. Just give them a chance because, because, you know, they, they tried. Um, and also what did we learn from this? Don't make a super long video from it because because who's going to want to watch this? I don't know. Someone will, maybe. Um, and here are my sources. I've got two pages of sources. Look them up. Uh, I'm also going to put them in the, in my description so that you can just like actually click them instead of looking at this and being like, okay, www. Like I'll put them in the description. And there are two um, YouTube videos that I watched from Wait in the Wings. That's a YouTube channel. And that did a really good job. They did a much better deep dive on these, on some of these musicals than I did. Uh, so go watch them. But um, yeah, I hope you had a good time listening to this. I hope you thought of this as like a podcast rather than a video because it wasn't a good video. <laughs> but, um yeah and if you're ever thinking of making a musical um don't do it just kidding make musicals but not not don't don't make any of the mistakes that that i talked about here and you'll be okay i promise okay peace out bye